Good evening, everybody. Um, please may I introduce myself first and foremost for the human being I am that stands before you today. Um, my father arrived in to Britain in the late 1950s. Like many migrants, he was invited here in search of work. He was from rural Punjab in India. He didn't speak a word of English. He came here with hopes, dreams, and aspirations. And um, he was um, moved to Derby. He was a foundry worker all his life. As the women did, they joined later. My mother came later on. And we were born here. I'm one of seven sisters, and I have one brother. We were all educated in Derby, in the British education system, and I watched the majority of my sisters being taken out of British schools at the age of 15 years old to marry men they had only ever met in photographs. They would disappear one by one to go to the rural Punjab to marry against their will. This was to be their arranged marriage. And nobody in school asked any questions about their absences. It's, it's absolutely happening today and debatable whether people question absences of young girls, predominantly South Asian, when they go missing from school roles. My sisters came back to Britain as somebody's wife, somebody's daughter-in-law. And one of my sisters, Rubina, whom I had a two-year age gap with, was actually put back into my year at school. The difference being is that she had missed nine months of school she was now somebody's wife. She had a wedding ring on her finger, and her whole appearance changed. She was no longer allowed to wear Western dress. And then she disappeared to become the dutiful wife to this man. I was 14 years old when I came home from school one day, and my mother sat me down, and she presented of the photo me with the photograph of the man I was to learn, I was promised to, from the age of eight. And I was the one who said, no, I am not marrying a stranger. I was born in Britain. I want to finish my exams. Dare I say, go to college or university. And I say dare I say, because being born in Britain did not give me the right to an education or the right to think freely and to have thoughts of independence for me to think beyond post-16. That resulted in my mother being very clear that where you are going, you do not need an education. You will be married like the rest of her daughters, and you will not shame this family. I protested more so when I was 15 and a half, and as a result, my family took me out of school, and they held me a prisoner in my own home. When I mean prisoner, I mean locked me in a room with the padlock on the outside of the door. I became invisible to the school system, and I'm sure my parents gave the Oscar-winning performance of why I was not in education, and they were believed, not me. So... I agreed to the marriage in the end purely to plan my escape. And I ran away from home at the age of 16 years old to make the point that I was not marrying a stranger. I ran away to Newcastle up north because I thought it was a good hiding place. My parents reported me missing to Derbyshire police. The police did find me. And here was an officer 35 years ago presented with a young person pleading with him not to send her back home because... If he were to send me back home, my parents would show the face of compromise and how I'm making all this up and they will not do this to me. But once the front door closed, it would be a very different world for me. Thankfully, the officer did believe me. He didn't engage in any mediation with my family, but he did say this. He said, Jasvindra, I will not tell your family where you are on the condition that you ring home and you tell your family you are safe and well, which is exactly what I did. I remember the conversation with my mother who answered the phone as if it were this morning, and I'm just going to recall that to you. So here I am, a 16-year-old young person, missing her family terribly and wanting them to say, it's okay, you've made your point, you can come back, it's fine. My mother answered the phone, and I'm ashamed to say the perpetrators of forced marriages and honor-based abuse are also women. My mother answered the phone, and she was very clear. She said, you either come back and marry who we say, or from this day forward, you are now dead in our eyes. I hope you give birth to a daughter who has done to you what you have done to me. Then you will know what it feels like to raise a prostitute. You have shamed us. You are dead in our eyes. You have shamed us. Do not show your face here again. And as a 16-year-old girl, I had a choice. I could have gone back home and had my family and everything I had ever known, or I could live a life 
of freedom and independence and choice and be disowned by my family. I chose the latter. And subsequently, I have been disowned, as have my three children, and I have a grandson for the past 35 years. I became a campaigner in 1993. I became a campaigner because of my sister's experience, Rubina. My sister Rubina was the one taken out of education and forced to marry. My sister suffered a horrific marriage. She was in her early 20s. My family's view was that it was her duty to uphold the honor of the family. She must not shame the family or the community by leaving her husband. So she was encouraged to return back to the perpetrator. I used to speak in secret to my sister, Rubina, that was her name, and I would say to her, come to me, I will protect you and I will support you. And she would say, it is okay for you to say that because you don't have to think about this concept of shame. So my sister was putting this concept before her own decision making, and she was absolutely right. I was disowned by my family. They no longer spoke to me. So she would return back and the community leaders were called out to speak to my sister. One was our local community leader. He was a counsellor. I can't label the dead, so I will name him. His name was Hadial Dinsa, a counsellor who became the first Lord Mayor, Indian Lord Mayor, actually, of Derby. And again, he reinforced the message, you must not dishonour and shame your family by leaving your husband. Your role is to make the marriage work. So she went back. And in the end, my sister set herself on fire, and she committed suicide. For whose honour? My family were very clear. I remember when I heard the news, I was a market trader in Leeds. I left school with no qualifications whatsoever. And I was a market trader and somebody came to my store one day and said, ring home, something terrible has happened to your sister. You must ring home. I rang home. My mother answered the phone and she was very clear again. Yes, your sister has committed suicide, but this does not change anything. You must not come to the funeral or show your face here. You have shamed this family. So nothing changed whatsoever. And it was a result of Rubina's experience that I came out of hiding. That was to be the catalyst to go back to my hometown and establish a charity called Nirvana to break the silence, my silence, Rubina's silence, and what I always fundamentally believed in 1993, the silence of many. And as a result of that, the charity, now a national charity and becoming an international charity, supports both men and women affected by forced marriages and honour-based abuse. This is a very... British problem. This is happening to British-born subjects. The help plan which I founded in my front room in 1993 became a national helpline in 2008. In the first five years, that helpline received 38,000 calls. Currently, we are dealing with over 750 calls a month, all of which are British nationals or British-born subjects, all of which are young, predominantly young people affected by these issues. We have taken our campaign to Parliament, and thankfully, I'm pleased to say, after 11 years of campaigning, forced marriage became a criminal offence on June the 16th last year. Finally, this government actually started to look at the issue instead of treating us as different. Somehow, this was cultural. One of the real issues that we contend with all the time is that somehow, because this is me and this is different, this is not child protection or public protection, the fear of offending communities the fear of not wanting to appear politically incorrect. I can give you an example. In one city in the UK, over 100 young, bright school, Asian females were missing off one school role in one academic year, over 100. They were aged 15 to 16 years old. They were missing just like that. And nobody asked where they had gone. I raised it in 2008 with the Prime Minister back then. And the point I made was this. If over 100 white British females weren't missing off our school roles, we would be jumping up and down and asking the questions about their absence. We didn't ask the question with these young people because they were Indian or Asian. It's what they do, isn't it? Isn't it part of their culture? Let me tell you this. It is not part of my culture to be abused. Cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. The culture out there, in terms of turning a blind eye, is endemic in this field. And we really have to get a grip of this. I want to be afforded the same level of protection as my white counterparts. I was born here, and I expect to be protected in the same way. So now we have a government forced marriage unit that is rescuing hundreds of British subjects back from predominantly India and Pakistan every year who are taken abroad and forced to marry. 
a third of the just over 250 they rescue every year are under the age of 17 years old. The youngest reported case of somebody at risk of forced marriage was two years old. And this is here in Britain, I kid you not. So, where is the campaign today? We have the helpline, we have civil and criminal legislation now. And one of the things that we have campaigned, been campaigning for is the Day of Remembrance to honor the memories of those who are murdered by the people who are meant to love them the most, their family members. You would have heard of the term honor killings, I'm sure, where well, we call them dishonorable killings. In 2003, Shafilia Ahmed was murdered by her mother and father. This was a young teenager whose ambition was to be a barrister at the age of 12. She was an A-star student at school. She had everything to live for. Her mother and father suffocated her to death in the presence of all her siblings because they deemed her to be too westernized. These young people are being abused on a daily basis for the basic rights and freedoms that Britain stands for. She was killed. And again, it sent out that message in our communities that if you behave like this dishonorably, shamefully, we're going to deal with you. Nobody speaks for these victims in the communities. I don't hear one member of my community stand up and speak out. So we want a day of remembrance. We have taken that forward since Shafilia's death in 2003. In this country, there have been over 150 reported honor killings. They're the ones we know about. So they don't even include the ones we don't know about. So I'm pleased to say we now have full cross-governmental support for a day of remembrance. It will be on July the 14th this year, being Shafilia Armour's birthday. This will be an opportunity to raise awareness, to get schools to engage, to get police forces to engage, to make the point the things you take for granted every single day in your life are often deemed as shameful by the victims that we serve, and they can be significantly harmed, forced into a marriage, or even killed for wanting the right to an education, the right to be a normal adolescent teenager, and I hope you will play a part in that as well. For me personally, if I was 16 today, I would make the same decision, because I have three children and a grandson now, and they will never inherit that legacy of abuse because of the decision their mother made when she was 16 years old. And equally, people are now, I'm optimistic, taking on board the campaign. And it's really important that you receive me as somebody who is not a victim. I'm a survivor. Yes, my family don't talk to me, but I made that choice and I stand by that choice today and on behalf of those who are not able to speak for themselves. So I say, my honor is their shame. Thank you.